That was enlightening. I learned a lot. The new QGIS uh, integration is actually really exciting to me. I think that's one of the simplest and most useful integrations between a desktop and a, a web application uh, for cartography that I've that I've seen personally. Um, our next speaker is Mel Imfeld. Mel is a mapping, data viz, and creative coding enthusiast with an academic background in urban planning and GIS. She leads map design at Mapbox, a team of passionate map designers who are building the next generation of digital maps. Mapbox powers uh, Mapbox maps power anything from a New York Times cover story to the navigation applications in your car that help you get from A to B. Mel's team builds custom maps and designs the Mapbox core styles, a selection of ready-made templates that help customers get started with a great map for any use case in Mapbox Studio. This morning, Mel will help us explore how moving people, packages, and vehicles from A to B poses unique challenges for digital map making. Map making for in-car navigation is driven by factors like safety, data accuracy, and freshness, unique form factors and efficiency. Mel will discuss how designing for these factors informs the architecture and design of effective navigation maps. Mel's talk this morning is titled Maps for Movement, the Unique Nature of Automative Navigation Maps. Please join me in welcoming Mel M. Feld. All right, can you all hear me? Nice. Um, so yeah, uh, welcome to my talk, um, Maps for Movement. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Unfortunately, I couldn't join the last couple of days, um, but I'm very you know, happy to hear from other panelists today, and it's really great to see sort of the diversity and you know, different places people come from. And I'm also excited to connect to map lovers in the room, which I'm sure there are many of you. Um, and I'm here to talk a bit about the things that we've been working on as map designers at Mapbox. And I got so excited about navigation maps that I forgot to include a slide to talk about who Mapbox actually is. So um, we're a mapping company, we're a digital mapping company. I'm just gonna sort of uh, improvise here a little, but we provide a variety of tools for digital mapping. Um, and one sort of like key feature of our, our, our tool stack is um, the rendering. So we have various libraries like GLJS and then like uh, native libraries that enable you to make digital maps. And, um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about or, you know, you know, our stack powers some of the things that I'm talking about. But uh, what I want to talk about is navigation maps and automotive specifically, because um, to give you some context, it's really been a big strategic investment for us at Mapbox um, over the last couple of years. So we've been working with a lot of automotive customers, and um, we've also really learned a lot about automotive navigation maps as we were doing this as map designers. And um, this is exactly what I want to talk about. I want to talk about unique characteristics of navigation maps and, and highlight some of these unique traits. So not all of them, just sort of selectively a few things that I think are particularly important. And I want to talk about like how we at Mapbox address this and also hopefully show some parallels to other navigation maps and that aren't strictly focused on, on automotive. And I also, I hope if time allows, I want to talk a bit about what's next for us. So things that we're kind of thinking about in the near future or far future actually. Um, so before we're, I'm going to move this a little over here, maybe. Okay. Um, before um, I want to go into the actual unique traits, I want to talk a bit about the context or like what, what the purpose is of an, an automotive map. And I think the goal of an automotive navigation map is pretty simple. It's about getting passengers and vehicles from A to B efficiently and safely. And if you're looking at the architecture here, um, there are a number of things that enable this. And um, you can think of sort of these uh, elements sort of being the key elements in navigation map. So you're starting with your base map, which is kind of this agnostic base map that contains all the layers that any map would contain, things like land, water, roads. And then you're layering these more specific things on top. So for example, ambient traffic, um, which is kind of, if you, you know, use Google Maps, you might have seen this as kind of this ambient traffic layer and incidents that we're putting on top. And then you have points of interest, which are kind of special in navigation mapping. 
Then you have a route line typically and a PUC, so something that's indicating where your vehicle is um, at a certain point. And then usually you have some kind of tool tips associated with that uh, route line and that PUC that give you more directional guidance. And then on top of that, you have the map UI. And the map UI is kind of like this widget-like thing that lets you interact with the map in an easy and efficient way. So um, I want to dedicate some of the rest of the talk to some of these layers in here uh, and really you know, highlight what is special about the, these layers um, in the context of navigation. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about is adaptability. And um, I want to show you some uh, how some of these map elements have to be highly adaptable to really serve automotive navigation in a good way. Um, so why does that adaptability matter? Um, first of all, you know, digital maps are not static, and that's you know, true for all digital maps, but I think it's particularly true for navigation maps, uh, which have to be highly adaptable. And the reason why they have to be so adaptable is because on one hand, journeys can take place under different environmental conditions. So you know, it might rain when you start your journey. And then also, um, it has to, they have to adapt to different needs at different phases of the journey. So it's not just navigation that you're doing. There's a bunch of steps you're going through as you're navigating from A to B. Um, you know, think about the phases of a journey, and I think this is a bit of a simplification here, but broadly you can sort of think of more four important phases that are relevant for us in the map. So you have exploration, which is when you kind of zoom and pan around the map, trying to see where you are respective to where you want to go. Um, you have search, so this is the moment where you type in your address or when you sort of select a specific category from like a pre-selection in the app somehow. And then you have the actual navigation, so this is when you're actually moving and in the car. And then finally you have the arrival when you're, you know, just before arriving at your final destination or, or, or already there. Um, so these may not happen sequentially, and sometimes some of them don't happen at all. But generally you can think of these phases um, as situations where um, you have different needs as a driver and where the map has to be relevant and adaptable to these different phases. And I think map adaptability is particularly important for points of interest. Um, so what we do in other mapping providers too um, is we're kind of making the map aware of specific needs by only surfacing certain points of interest in each time. So for example, when you're in the exploration phase, um, you may want to see a variety of points of interest. You may want to see relatively high density to really get a sense and you know what, what area you're in, where you're going, trying to go to. And then once you're in search mode, you probably only want to surface the categories that are you know, relevant in that particular moment. So you know, probably a high density to give you relative um, good choice of places to go to. And then when you're in navigation, you actually want to highlight things like you know, maybe charging station if you have an EV or, or rest stops. And you probably want to show those things that are nearby the route. And kind of similarly, once you're in arrival, you might want to highlight things like parking. So um, you can see here already a map is by no means static. It kind of on constantly adapts to where, where you are in the phase of your journey. Um, another way to think about needs is through personal preferences. And you can just see two examples here of how the map adapts to personal preferences as well. So something like frequently visited POI, which is kind of indicated here by this uh, light blue um, icon with a heart, um, so it's something that we can tell, um, you know, something you, a place you've been visiting often. Or then on the other hand, which is I think something very interesting, is routes that are taken frequently. So um, if knowing your personal preferences, so you know, maybe you've taken a route 12 trips as opposed to one that you've only taken two or three trips, um, we can actually say, okay, maybe this route is more relevant to you, even though it might not be the sort of one that gets you from A to B um, the fastest. So that's another way how we can um, think about map adaptability um, in the context of personal preferences. Um, I mentioned environmental factors in the beginning as well. So um, I want to show you some examples of environmental factors. So what we see here is um, one of our recently released features, and I'm really sorry, it's kind of blurry. I didn't think we'd have such a big screen here. Um, but you can also look at the demo here if you want to see something that's a bit more high res. Um, but yeah, what you're seeing here is our newest release. Um, it's um, our, our, our latest style called Standard. And um, what we're using is something called Global Light. Um, so it's kind of a global light that shines on the map and it lets you mimic the time of day conditions. So it's one map 
just having the light shine on it and you can sort of a minute you know m many different times of day states in just one single map and i think that's very powerful for us as cartographers because we're kind of we have this problem of having to maintain many different map variants which can become very cumbersome and that's a way to make the map more situationally aware um, we can also use this um, effect for other things so for example we can use it to mimic uh, weather conditions in a map um, and you can really use this light to create something like here so you could have both your time of day so morning versus day for example and then you can use these different lighting um, and, and shadow effects to create like you know a clear morning for example or um, a hazy afternoon something like that so really gives you a lot of way to um, kind of encode um, environmental factors onto the map. Um, I want to jump over and to switch from adaptability to another trait, which is real time data, because that's, you know, really important for navigation maps. And I want to show you some choices of how, um, how we deal with visualizing real time data. And I think it kind of makes sense here to pick uh, an example and that the example I want to show you is traffic because it's something that I personally worked with a lot and you know kind of also seen the challenges in that space and I mentioned before I, I call this ambient traffic so it's not the traffic that you have on the route line but sort of the one that's kind of all over the map of your your navigating um so What's special about traffic? Um, on one hand, one thing that we've noticed by um, you know doing user research and speaking to customers is that congestion visualizations are really highly subjective. So what one considers as moderate may not be what another person considers as moderate traffic. So that's a really important thing uh, or characteristic about traffic. And the other thing is that raw congestion data is super detailed and it can be extremely overwhelming for a driver to take in. So, you know, one key question is how can we reduce the complexity and make it easier for driver to detect patterns? And um, there are a number of ways uh, how we're doing this at Mapbox. So um, I wanna highlight three variables here that I think are particularly important. So number one is color. Um, so you can see here on the right hand side, we're taking these um, large um, numeric values. So we have values from one to 100 that we're bucketing um, traffic into. We're taking this and we're mapping it down to like a four color or like a, 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 a scale of four buckets with four colors. So that's one thing to make this a little easier um, for drivers to understand. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're doing um, road class filtering. So again, if you look here on the right hand side, uh, what you can see is like, um, at a very low zoom level, so low meaning really far zoomed out at Z5, you might only see highways because those are, you know, a more important class. And then as you're kind of going down to a zoom level 16 or so, you might actually see um, things like streets, which are a much more granular level. And that's a way to sort of, you know, um, limit the amount of information that a, a driver sees at each point um, in time. And then the last thing which isn't visible here, um, but really important too, is feature aggregation. So you can generally think of the map as the more you're zoomed out, the more traffic is aggregated. So you can, for example, assume that you know a, a really large uncongested segment might take priority over a tiny um, congested segment. And, and this is so that we can reduce the visual load on the driver and really sort of like focus on these like large scale patterns. Um, I also mentioned, um, you know, the subjectiveness of traffic. Um, so one thing that we found is that congestion coloring really depends on what drivers are used to. So, you know, what kind of applications do they commonly use, but also, and I thought that was quite interesting, it's kind of dependent on the cultural context. Um, and the way we're sort of enabling our customers in automotive there is we're giving them choices. So um, you can see here two examples of like traffic profiles. So it's essentially simply rebucketing those numbers. Um, so uh, at the top, you have sort of a more aggressive way of um, showing traffic. And on the bottom, you have so something that's, you know, um, a bit less aggressive. So you can see how different um, those maps can look depending on which traffic profile you choose. But we've really seen that maps, um, you know, even different providers can really vastly differ in like how they, what they consider congested or not. Um, I want to jump over to the last characteristic from here. Um, I think it's one where 
customization also plays a really big role. Um, it's form factors. And um, I, I don't think there's really a way to talk about navigation maps and automotive without talking about form factors because it's you know such a unique thing about in vehicle navigation maps. And um, why specifically does it matter so much? Um, I think one thing here to notice is that um, devices share a lot of compute power with other apps. So if you have your in-vehicle navigation device, it's probably sharing resources with a lots of other applications at the same time. And the other thing is that when these devices are procured, this can take years until you're actually starting the development cycle. And by the point where we get the, you know, the, the hardware is essentially already outdated and that has a really big impact on performance. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is that Customers really go wild when it comes to screens and cars. Um, so what you see here in the back is totally possible. You've seen things like that. Um, there are you know, more screens, there are more screen um, sizes and variants, and they're really wildly different across customers, which makes it really important um, that we um, test automotive maps um, early because um, things like you know the device type really affects um, things like color it affects uh, contrast and size of the map and, and we want to make sure that they really look good um, when they actually you know hit the the, the, the customer's vehicles and um, what we do is whenever we can we're actually testing on the target device directly and ideally we're even you know driving around with the car so that we get the sense of like what it's like um, driving around with that um, in vehicle map but very often um, you know we're a remote company it's not always possible to do that and also these devices are typically kind of rare just before they're um, uh, sorry throughout the de development cycle so um, there's another way that we use um, is we're kind of emulating a target device and what you see here on the screen is a browser widget that we built so it lets you sort of encode different types of devices um, and you can then sort of emulate the size uh, and the aspect ratio of that particular device. And you can also embed a, um, a UI on top of it to get a sense of what your map will look like. Um, but you know that gives you a good sense of the sizing in particular, but it might not necessarily help you with things like color, which is very specific to a target device and also very hard to emulate. But yeah, it's a good sort of in-between solution for early testing. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention here, and this is getting a bit technical, especially if you're maybe less familiar with um, uh, digital mapping, but I still wanted to uh, you know, punt on it because I think um, that's something that's really, really important to us. Um, so navigation maps have to be extremely performant and they have to be performant even on low end devices. And we have extremely high standards for things like frame rate, for example, so that we can really ensure that the experience is smooth. And one thing we're doing is um, we're kind of testing our style syntax. So the syntax is kind of how we encode or how we're telling the render to visualize information. And we're testing that syntax to make sure it's written efficiently. And what we've done is, um, um, or, or um, my team has developed this um, feature, um, it's called style linter. And what you can do is you can go through the syntax and you can um, lint it to see where you have a not efficiently written expression uh, that's part of our syntax. And um, sort of it gives you indications on how you can write it better. So that's what you see here on the left hand side. So it's a you know a terminal um, tool. And then just here on the other side, you don't have to you know know exactly what this says here, but it will also tell you how to rewrite a less performant syntax into a more performant syntax, um, which is really helpful and is really making a huge difference on um, on performance and um, yeah how smoothly a map behaves. Um, okay, so I'm definitely over time. Uh, I want to very quickly talk about trends. Um, these were, you know, present time things, um, but for the sake of time, time I'm just going to rush through this quickly. I do want to touch on, you know, what's in the future for us. And I think one thing that's really important is um, the idea of unifying map variants. This is something we're already doing. So, you know, in the past, automotive maps have come in many flavors. Um, there was the main map, there was a junction view, there was the ADAS view. If you, you know, been in a Tesla, you know, there's ADAS, there's kind of this high definition uh, visualization and the map, and they've been looked at as different things, but we're working towards is having one map that does both an ADAS view, it's like what you see here. So this is an actual map, um, but then also, you know, traditional mapping things. Um, and uh, yeah, we're launching standard next week uh, in, in general availability. So definitely check it out to see some of the high fidelity there. 
Um, medium term, um, don't want to go into much detail, but definitely, you know, LLMs are front and center for us. So think about how we can use voice assistance to um, make guidance easier for customers. So both to give better spatial recommendations, but also, you know, tap into other aspects of entertainment, like playing music, for example, or I don't know, um, answer questions about trivia, for example. And then long term, and this is something I'm really passionate about and thinking a lot about is thinking about maps in the context of autonomous driving and the question what happens when navigation becomes less important because you're in a fully automated vehicle and you don't actually need to navigate necessarily anymore. And I think what we can tap into there is some of our work that we've been doing with ride sharing because that's kind of a similar situation. You're sitting in a car without actually doing anything. And um, some important things to think about is, you know, could you do more discovery, for example, as you're um, sitting in a vehicle? Could you learn more about the city that you're driving through? Or could you um, and, uh, embed some kind of factor of gamification? So something like city trivia um, or similar to make this more engaging. Or then lastly, you know, more from the business lens, um, you know, for, for a company after all is, could there be sort of targeted advertisement kind of like billboards you have on the actual road? You could, you know, also have billboards in an application, for example. So just some things to think about um, as we're moving to, you know, um, a different way of getting from A to B. And this is also my last slide. I had to rush through this a little bit, but thank you for having me. Um, I look forward to discussions and debates about this topic. to come back up to the front. We'll get some, some infrastructure here. All right, great. We have oh, excellent. Don't even have to get started. Here we go. Um, great presentations, all three of you. Um, I have a question for Elspeth and um, for Mamata. So I was struck um, at the beginning of your talk. You said that in indigenous thinking, there is some thought that there is some stuff that should not be visualized. Data, some data, should be protected from co-option. Um, I, I found that really interesting, but I also thought when I when I was listening to Mamata talking about um, use of felt for creating new maps of environments, and in the Canadian context, you're aware of the um, uh, the resident the terrible history of residential schools where children buried in unmarked graves, and there are Many projects across Canada to discover them. So, um, in terms of making data visual, is there any thought that those kinds of tools could be used to map and explore and tell the story of this terrible hit in Canadian history? Yeah, so I think there there's a few parts to to the question, and um, I think what I originally had thought about talking a little bit about kind of the the um, you know discovery <laughs> in air quotes of of children's remains at these residential schools, um, and I think one one thing I wanted to kind of say about that is that um, the even though it was framed like in 2021 when there were a lot of this was in the news a lot, it was framed as this kind of like new discovery of of um, information that we didn't have before. Um, but the reality is that indigenous peoples already knew about that. Um, and that this was just confirmation of something that was known but had been sort of um, suppressed and hidden from the general public. Um, 
and and so I think that that's kind of a that's a tricky one where it's like where if we um, we have to think about like what what do we actually want to visualize you know without um, doing something that is traumatizing and disrespectful. Um, so I think that there's that's kind of the issue is figuring out like how can we communicate uh, like this sort of very you know traumatic uh, sad. Um, violent, terrible experience, but do it in a way that isn't going to re-traumatize. Um, uh, so I have a question for Marmata about felt. This is kind of a more of a technical question. Um, <clears throat> so felt is bec is becoming such a great, easy kind of entry product for um, teaching you know, new novice geospatial users. I, I use it more and more often. I think Stace uses it. We, we, we use it all the time now here to kind of like as the, the gateway drug to like, you know, come <laughs> come make maps and stuff because it's so easy to teach with and it does so many things, but it's it's super not intimidating. Um, because of that, because of the way it's built and it's not intimidating, um, but it still has a lot of complexity to it. It's a great tool. So it's a great tool for us at the academic university level. Um, my wife is a STEAM teacher at a middle school. It's also a great tool for young kids. Like it seems like the kind of thing that you could in inject in um, middle school and um, grade school classrooms. Um, and I know from dealing with those kinds of environments that um, it's often the, the, the limitation is like teacher access tools. Um, so enabling people to teach with the tool. Um, things like um, guest modes or have you know a teacher teacher tools for ingesting entire um, lists of student emails because at, at grade school level students don't uh, they don't they're not they don't know what their email is or, or they have like these really obscure passwords um, that you have to protect and so getting like all 40 kids in a classroom like on something so you can teach them this stuff before and there's a bunch of other um, um, things around that for teachers at those lower levels. I'm just curious if that stuff that felt is thinking about or teacher um, enabling teachers at like grade school, middle school levels to use this as a teaching tool. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, happy to hear um, being used here. And I also think it's a great uh, gateway drug to maps um, and that I it's it's been used a lot um, in the education context and we um, have we are currently working on a larger um, education initiative but what we've also had are a lot of our users that are in k through 12 um, putting out content for how they're using it in the classroom so answer short answer is yes we're definitely thinking about it um, please have her get in touch with us too, because um, we're very uh, customer driven and love use cases. And our roadmap is very much based on um, how people are using the product and things that they need. Uh, education will be free. Um, one of the things you're saying right now is it is very hard to add a list of people to a team um, to all collaborate on a map. So that is something that we will work on right now. You have to add everybody one by one. and. Um, that kind of stuff. So yes, we're definitely thinking about all of that and get in touch. I just want to uh, make one further comment. I, I would also suggest, and Mamatha didn't highlight this on uh, on her slides, but there's a fantastically busy Slack channel uh, for felt. And I myself has have actually requested two features and seen them appear in felt within weeks. And so uh, they are incredibly responsive. They are looking for uh, what are the things that communities like this want to see in the platform, and they are putting them into the platform when we ask for them. So please do uh, make use of, uh, of the community features and uh, uh, Slack channels and so on to, uh, to ask for the things that you wish you could see uh, in felt. That's a good segue into what I was going to ask uh, for Elspeth. And thank you. That was a really fabulous talk. Um, trying to bridge um, your talk with the other talks and thinking about like indigenous. Um, well, the question for you is, you know, in the communities that you're working with who are working on mapping in various registers, um, what is, is there a discussion? What is the discussion about map tech? And what are things that would be useful that aren't there? Ready, like different base maps or different data collection or non-data collection regimes and anything. You know, 
what is the discussion about that things that would be useful for the kinds of cartography project that indigenous groups are doing? Yeah, thanks. I'll, maybe I'll pick up on what I was um, saying at the beginning of the talk, kind of trying to give a quick overview of sort of like questions of data sovereignty um, within kind of more technological approaches. Um, I think there's sort of a, um, there, there, you know, like a lot of tribal nations have an indigenous GIS office, you know, their own uh, nation's GIS office, and they're using it in the way that other GIS offices are doing things. But, um, but there's also, you know, um, a lot of concerns about like maybe like archaeological data um, and, and this, these kinds of tensions around like wanting to be able to map and know where things are, um, but also not wanting that information to be easily accessible. So I think a lot of the questions are around how do you um, how do you make this knowledge available for an indigenous your own indigenous nation um, without making that knowledge available for just anybody. And so I think a lot of the tensions with um, GIS tech, you know, various types of mapping tech in indigenous nations is around that protection of data. Um, and I think like you know uh, beyond thinking beyond um, just having like a protected server. And so I think that is something that people are trying to figure out um, and, you know, don't necessarily always feel like completely satisfied with what is available. Um, and I think that's that's why I'm interested in these kind of more artistic approaches to thinking about especially cultural information, um, because there are ways that people can uh, represent uh, spatial information in ways that uh, maybe like we can all see. Like you could have a painting where we can all look at it and we could say what we think we see in the image. Um, but there's information that's in that image that could be encoded in a way that um, you would have to be a community member or um, or even, you know, a, a community within a community in order to interpret that information. So I think a lot of it is around that uh, protection of cultural information. The three uh, presentations today also triggered some other thoughts in my mind uh, coming where you're coming from, from a cultural perspective. Um, are we looking at for in Mapbox or felt looking? Are we looking at digital colonization right now because we're getting to a standard of how we're using tools, how we're perceiving the tools and the outcome of the tools from a Western perspective? Or are you also considering other cultures in terms of how they're seeing and valuing, for example, color? Colors have different meanings in different countries in different um, cultural um, settings or colorblind people, red and green. I'm seeing a lot of stuff that seems to be mainstream focused from a US perspective, but I, what are you doing to think about outside the Western English box? I, I, can, I can start. Um, yeah, I mean, so at Mapbox, we're, we're essentially, we're a B2B business to some extent, so we're making tools for customers to enable them to make maps. And there are definitely a lot of initiatives that kind of think about, you know, global mapping and not just US centric mapping. So I'm thinking about various things, but for example, like worldviews. So the ability to switch between different worldviews because not everybody sees the world the same. That's the reality. Or things like rendering um, different types of scripts. So the ability for a render to, um, you know, um, render non Latin scripts. I think that's really important um, in other cultures to make sure the map is readable. Um, also, um, kind of in the same way, vein, we have um, places that are disputed. Um, not all places are seen as, um, you know, belong to one political district as another. So I think there are a lot of tools around that that we can give to our customers to kind of like customize the map in, in some way. So that's one aspect. And then the other thing that we're, we've had for a very long time in our tools um, is sort of, um, enabling things like um, testing your map for color blindness. So in our uh, in browser tool called Studio, you can switch between different common types of color blindness um, to check if your map adheres to best practices. Um, we haven't done so much yet into like um, screen readers or accessibility for blind people, for example, but I do think actually going back to large language models or, or, or chat GPT have actually tried passing in an image the other day and it had a pretty accurate description um, of what you can actually see in a map. And I thought that was very interesting because it might open up some new alleys of how to think about, you know, making maps accessible for people who can't actually see the map. Uh, so yes, felt also a tool for um, map making. We 
Definitely in our data library, we need to get better, but we do try and offer some global data sets as a start. Like we're seeing a lot of people don't have data right off the bat. Um, we do detect your URL and change the language uh, on the base map, depending where you are. Um, we do actually work with screen readers because you can actually tab through um, everything as much as you could uh, do control C, control V. You could also tab to get to um, different parts of the interface. From the cartographic perspective, as much as I've been able to, I think the hardest one has been, uh, as we all know, getting categorical palettes that are completely colorblind safe um, is, is challenging, uh, but there are there is work out there. Um, two of them that I've added for that context are from Paul Toll, who's done a lot of uh, research in this area. So um, as much as I can, uh, while building in the cartographic thinking into the tool, trying to borrow from um, well-known standards and work that's already been done um, around a lot of this. Uh, and yeah, I think, you know, that's a conversation that, uh, oh, and the other thing, like when I was showing drawing the route, um, I, I labeled it, I put the distance on it and it showed in miles, but, um, you can have your entire map settings, uh, be in, um, metric units. So it could be kilometers. You could have your areas, everything. Um, so that's just like a setting, um, that, that that's available. Um, and available on every map. And yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done for, for us. And I think what we're being so new, um, we've been in company for two years. We've had our product out for one year. Um, a lot of what we're also doing is understanding where in the world, because as we're developing so quickly, we need to um, have have the things that people who are using it a lot um, help us go through test try um, and so yeah other questions wonderful presentations thanks um i've been trying to add uh, digital maps to our collections it's really hard because they don't last, you know. And so I think this is for Felt and Mapbox. I know you're in the middle of building something and it's so exciting and it's just wonderful, but can preservation work into your thinking long-term? Are these maps gonna last? If, if I make one of your maps, of course I can print it out and then it will last, but if I wanna keep the digital version alive, uh, this is a challenge, and not just for you, it's true for all, Stace, you've all talked about it here, all providers of GIS. So just, is that a part of your thinking? Has it come up? Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, that's a really good point. Happens to me all the time too, in, uh, with maps that I've made, I try and go to them, they don't load, or uh the data doesn't show and it's like oh no what's going on i just i spent hours on this younger me uh and i would like to use it see it um share it uh that's a really good point and something uh that i definitely will take back to the office for us to just think about um in general i know one thing that we are working on is um, kind of version history so a lot of times too what we're doing as cartographers map makers um, gis people is uh, going through different versions of a map many times and doing different trying out different design ideas and that kind of stuff so uh we will be storing uh um version history, which I could see tying into the preservation more long term. But um, thank you for saying that. And I think it's really important to taking it back to the office. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Very challenging topic. And I actually had to laugh because we had such a hard time printing out something. <laughs> so it took us, really took us a while to find something that we could print. Um, yeah, so this is a big topic. Um, so I will say one thing, which is that Mapbox has been really good about this idea of backward compatibility. So making sure things last for a very long time. And actually, 
often surprised how how you can still things you know open things that have been around for a really long time so if you think of like our we used to have like classic styles a very long time ago and they're still supported so it's it's really remarkable but i think there's still you know a big question and i think that's a question for all digital uh, material um you can store these json files on your computer but you know like they're just going to be there just like your photos or your videos like how are you going to you know preserve them for like 20 30 40 years and, and i don't think we've yeah we have a good answer for that yet it's it's just a json if you don't have the right tool to look at it with it's 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 kind of useless and and that's you know really interesting question to think about and something i will mull on to for a little bit i'm not actually a librarian i just play one at work um, and uh, with my feral librarian hat on, we we have we've discussed this a lot, um, and and uh, for for years talked about the 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 challenge of digital preservation in the context of digital scholarly objects, and and it always sort of boils down to one dream, and that's a, a button to export to CSS, HTML, and JavaScript, and uh, and while that you know uh, won't solve problems for the long term future because how long are those going to be supported uh protocols in and how long are browsers going to be a thing uh you know the uh the, you know over the last couple of uh um years things have changed very rapidly but but at the very least uh it provides a way for the content to be uh to be um sort of preserved with its dynamic capabilities and i think you know a lot of a lot of places punt uh by providing export to pdf and and image uh capabilities but i think what makes these uh these objects so valuable is their dynamic uh abilities and and we would love to see uh, an export to um, to a, at least a package, an archive of some sort that we could uh, preserve in perpetuity. Uh, and then, you know, it's it's uh, we actually do a lot of work um, in the space of providing uh, backwards compatibility for old technology, so that we can continue to uh, uh, to use these old uh, types of dynamic uh, content. We have uh, software as a service uh, for. Um, obsolete platforms where we can run old DVD content and things of that sort, and so, and so, um, that would actually make it possible for us to sort of build uh, preservation platforms around what capabilities uh, have been provided for us to to export the content that we're interested in preserving. So, any other questions? We might reach out to you in twenty years or so. You can reach out to me in twenty minutes if you want. <laughs> uh, I am hyper available to all of you because one of the things that I really like to do, and Mamata knows this about me, is provide feedback that shows up in your platforms and makes my life easier and the and the lives of my my patrons easier. So. Yeah.